Hi, my name is uh, Jennifer Maranke and I'm at Penn State Hershey Medical Center. I have the pleasure of being here today with Dr. Vivek Kambari, who's the Director of Bariatric Endoscopy at Johns Hopkins Medical Institution in Baltimore. Uh, thanks so much for being here today, Vivek. Oh, my pleasure. I'm very excited to be here. And we're going to be discussing your article, Gastric Mucosal Devitalization Reduces Adiposity and Improves Lipid and Glucose Metabolism in Obese Rats. So this is a fascinating study. Can you um, tell me about the rationale and a little bit of background information? Yeah, thank you. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's a topic that uh, I'm particularly passionate about. You know, I think we've, uh, in, in the field of endobariatrics, we've been doing a lot of work in terms of trying to reduce the volume of the stomach or, or sort of emulate what's happened with bariatric surgery by excluding uh, sort of du uh, duodenal contents from uh, b sort of touching the duodenal mucosa. And, and, you know, there's been a lot of work showing that some endobariatric therapies result in weight loss. We wanted to take a step back a bit and, and sort of learn more about bariatric surgery. Uh, and and what, what is really the, the critical component of bariatric surgery that results in the greatest benefit? And if we can find the one or two uh, components that we think really uh, you know, result in that very dramatic metabolic change that happens uh, almost immediately after bariatric surgery, mm -hmm. uh, and basically take those pieces and, and uh, you know, emulate those changes endoscopically, uh, then we think we can have a, a more profound metabolic effect uh, rather than just sort of pursue weight loss, uh, which is important. Uh, but I think if we can have a therapy that will in fact result uh, in, uh, in metabolic uh, improvements that are out of proportion to weight loss, uh, we, we will really be uh, sort of pushing this frontier uh, and sort of uh, allowing a more uh, a beneficial therapy uh, to uh, disseminate to patients. And so why did you focus on the gastric mucosa in this study? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very interesting and, and somewhat controversial almost. I think these uh, uh, you know, you, you look at the rule my gastric bypass, which was really the, the gold standard operation right. uh, for obesity, not only for weight loss, but to, to manage metabolic disease. And, and often uh, it's felt that, uh, you know, not only is it the, the reduction in volume of the stomach by creating the pouch, but also the, the, uh, the exclusion of, of oral contents from entering the proximal duodenum uh, that result in, in benefit. But, you know, as, as over the last decade, sleeve gastrectomy has been gaining traction, and, and then right. there's been some, some uh, you know, increasing volume of literature that, in fact, shows that a lot of the, the weight loss and metabolic change, uh, at least in the first one to two years, um, is, is, is very similar in, in sleeve gastrectomy uh, as it is in rural white gastric bypass. So, 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 and in a similar way that rural white gastric bypass results in, you know, the significant, uh, you know, metabolic change uh, early on, uh, we're finding those, those changes uh, in sleeve gastrectomy as well. So we thought if there's a, a method of, of uh, really sort of uh, finding the, the most critical component of sleeve gastrectomy, uh, then maybe we can find a simple endoscopic solution towards this. And, and we know that in patients who have a, a surgical sleeve gastrectomy, uh, you know, within hours uh, there's a significant improvement in, in glucose metabolism. You know, within 24 hours, a large majority of patients have had you know, large uh, reductions in insulin requirements. Um, and, you know, this is before any oral intake or any weight loss. So right. there's, there's something that appears hormonally active uh, in the stomach. Um, and we know that the mucosa uh, is, in fact, you know, a, a, an endocrinologically uh, active organ. Um, you know, certainly the, the muscle and, and the serosa doesn't appear to be. So as endoscopists, we have uh, great access to the mucosa yes. of the stomach. And, and so we thought by pursuing that as a potential target, we'd... Uh, you know, we, we wanted to see if, if that did in fact result in, in some sort of improved metabolic profile. And so how did you carry out this study? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it was a challenging study and certainly as a, a clinical gastroenterologist, I right. had uh, very little experience in, 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 uh, in sort of rodent models. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd, I'd, I'd done some uh, investigational work in, in porcine models. Uh, and so we partnered with, uh, with, with a very strong uh, group in Germany that had done a lot of um, sort of surgical research in, in, in rodents particularly rats, and they had developed this, this very nice obese rat model. And I think it's important that we do these therapies in sort of a metabolically deranged models, right. uh, you know, that ha sort of rodents that have sort of lots of uh, you know, visceral fat, etc. cetera. Uh, so, so they had a, a nice validated model uh, that they'd worked with, and, and so we, we partnered with them. Uh, and and um, so we, we did experiments whereby we uh, compared a sort of a sham group versus a, a sleeve gastrectomy group, and then we did this procedure that we've sort of termed gastric mucosal devitalization, mm -hmm. uh, a method of basically uh, ablating tissue in the stomach. And so how did you go about ablating the, the, the uh, gastric tissue? Yeah, no, it's, 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 uh, it's very interesting using um, sort of thermal technologies in rats, mm -hmm. and particularly gaseous technologies in, in stomachs that are, that are tiny. Right. Um, and, and so the, the, the group in Germany um, 
uh, sort of did. Uh, sort of, we had over 100 rats. We randomized them uh, into three groups. We initially sort of looked at uh, a sort of a lean, so if we wanted to first v validate this high fat diet uh, model again for the purposes of this experiment. So we, we had a chowd diet group and then a high fat diet group and, and we showed that there were significant metabolic derangements in, in this model. And then we uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, did another experiment whereby we had three groups, a, a sham, uh, sleeve gastrectomy group and, and a, a, a gastromucosal devitalization group and then we went on and did experiments uh, initially short term uh, at two weeks and then uh, and then we did another experiment where we sacrificed the rats at four weeks and then again at eight weeks um, and the, from a technical perspective we would simply uh, you know the, it's a surgical sleeve we used a small incision or a staple gun mm -hmm. uh, has been done many times uh, the, the sham group we basically accessed the stomach uh, and then we, uh, we lavage the stomach mm -hmm. uh, as a sort of a, as a method of tampering it. Uh, and then with the uh, devitalization group, we used argon plasma coagulation. So, uh, uh, so a very small incision, brought the stomach out, uh, accessed the stomach uh, and, uh, with a little camera, and then basically uh, started doing uh, argon plasma coagulation to the mucosa. And you could actually see the, uh, the, the, the light on the external surface of the oh, stomach, wow. and that in fact helped guide us uh, as to as to where to uh, to ablate, yeah. uh, as well as the camera that was on the inside. Um, clearly, we had to be somewhat limited. These stomachs are very small. There's a large volume right. of gas expansion, uh, but the procedure was, uh, you know, there's a learning curve mm -hmm. to doing this. Uh, you know, some of the rats, um, um, you know, had uh, had some trouble early on, but once we sort of understood and perfected the technique, we sort of uh, began that study. And you aimed basically for around seventy percent, uh, mainly focusing on the greater curvature. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I, I think we, we know that greater curvature is, is an important part from a uh, neurohormonal uh, and, and satiety perspective. Uh, you know, the, the, the fundus in particular is thought to be very important f from this, f uh, with regards to this. You know, what, what we wanted to do is basically uh, demonstrate that uh, we had a method of, of altering uh, you know, this model metabolically without mm -hmm. um, reducing gastric volume. Uh, because th there's, been, there's been many studies in, in both uh, humans and rodents to demonstrate that the effect of uh, the positive effect of sleeve gastrectomy uh, s doesn't seem to be related uh, to gastric restriction, that there's mm -hmm. another phenomenon uh, that's causing it. And so the, the sleeve gastrectomy model was basically a, a method by which we removed gastric mucosa and reduced volume, and our gastric mucosal devitalization uh, model was essentially one we, we uh, removed um, sort of gastric mucosa, but maintained normal gastric volume. We oh, want yeah. to see the independent effects uh, of tampering with the gastric mucosa. What kind of outcomes were you looking for? What were some of the outcome measures? Yeah, I mean, I think we were, we were open early on, mm -hmm. uh, but we were, we were very interested in sort of metabolic change. And so uh, we wanted to look at visceral adiposity. Uh, and, and then particularly we want to look at tissue adiposity and, and in particular from a GI perspective I was interested in, in uh, liver fat. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, uh, we looked at the amount of fat in the liver. Uh, we also looked at eating behaviors. Uh, so we looked at food intake uh, and then we looked at hormonal profiles, uh, sort of uh, HOMA IR, glucose um, and, uh, and then sort of GLP-1 ghrelin and, and some other hormones. Uh, you know, interestingly, there's some sort of toxic uh, free fatty acids such as palmitate, which, which we realized uh, were also, um, uh, so there were some improvements in there as a result of the procedure. So, you know, we, we, uh, it was really a, a very open book early on. We, mm -hmm. we weren't entirely sure exactly what to measure. Sure. And, uh, um, you know, there were some interesting and important findings that, uh, that we think we came up with. What was probably one of the most unexpected findings? You know, I, I think the, uh, the, 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 the quite dramatic reduction in visceral fat uh, that we saw on, on gross examination when we'd open up these rats, uh, but and also uh, you know when, when we measured fat content, uh, was, was, was somewhat surprising. You know, there, there's very few endoscopic therapies, uh, or none that we really know of, that sort of result in a preferential loss of visceral fat. And, and here, uh, you know, the amount of visceral fat was dramatically reduced, as was subcutaneous fat. But certainly, there seem, there seemed to be at least grossly a, a, um, a preferential loss of, of visceral fat. Uh, and that was really exciting and, and we realized from a, uh, a scientific perspective a very important finding. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then just in terms of the three groups, what were some of the other findings or the other results? Yeah, so the, um, it, it, it was a, a slightly um, challenging model for me to get my head around. You know, in humans, when we do a, a surgical therapy or an endoscopic therapy, you know, we, we alter lifestyle and we alter eating behaviors. 
Uh, you know, so no one would have surgery and then you, you, feed, you feed, feed them at libitum and right. they go and eat what they want. But to these rat models, we, uh, you know, we, we, we wanted to expose them to, um, you know, as much oral intake as, as, they, as they wanted. Uh, so it, it's hard to translate exactly what happened in rats to humans and, and potentially, um, you know, by sort of altering lifestyle, uh, what one might have seen a, an even greater effect as a result of these therapies um, than what was seen in, in our study. Um, so, so I, I think uh, that was uh, an important consideration when we were com comparing the different groups and, and as we thought about translating that to, to humans. Now, you did repeat endoscopies at two, four, and eight weeks? Yeah, no, we, we unfortunately were unable to, to, to do repeat endoscopies, but, but we, uh, you know, when we did our analysis and measured fat, we sort of sacrificed the animals at that time. Okay. Uh, so we sacrificed you know, 10 animals at two weeks, another 10 at, at, uh, at four weeks, and, and another 10 at eight weeks. And, and we know, you know if, if you compare sort of the, 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 the lifespan of a rat to a human, mm -hmm. uh, it's very different, of course. And so we, it's believed that sort of one day of a rat is equivalent to about 30 human days. And so you know, if you extrapolated that, and, and it might be a little bit simplistic to do so, but you know, our follow-up was effectively several years if, if one would think about a, doing the same thing in a human model. So it was somewhat long-term. Sure. And, and over those eight weeks, um, where did you see the, the greatest changes or the, the, um, the most profound changes in, in fat yeah, or in uh, weight? So, so the, there were changes uh, as early as two weeks uh, and four weeks and eight weeks. And, and, and what was very nice is that uh, although some uh, hormones and some eating behaviors would normalize at eight weeks, uh, there wasn't that normalization in, 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 in some other components such as visceral fat. Uh, there was a persistence uh, in, in improved glucose homeostasis. Uh, even throughout the um, duration of therapy. I mean, we, when we, 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 uh, we, we think we did a, a nice homogeneous job of, of ablating uh, the gastric mucosa and, mm -hmm. and, and not sort of hurting the, 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 the muscle layer too much. Uh, and, uh, you know, regeneration, of course, is, is going to happen. Uh, you know, that's certainly what, what, what the rat and, and the humans will, will do. Uh, so we did see mucosal regeneration o over the weeks. Uh, but despite regeneration of, of the mucosa, and there was almost normalization by eight weeks, uh, we didn't see uh, that same improvement or, or that same uh, normalization in, in some, uh, some other sort of very uh, important uh, free fatty acids and, 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 and sort of glucose, home IR, uh, and, uh, and fat. So because of the more sustainable response and some of those other markers, you can't just attribute, you know, um, ablating the mucosa and ulcer forming and then that rat not wanting to eat because of some sort of structural damage or pain. Uh, because there were some other markers that were more persistent even when that ulcer had healed. That's correct. Uh, I, I think uh, we, we were particularly cognizant of this when we were designing the experiment and, and we, uh, we, we wanted to perform uh, the most minimally invasive therapy whereby we'd sort of almost exclusively uh, uh, sort of treat the, the gastric mucosa uh, sort of in an attempt to not cause the animals uh, to, to be too unwell. No, we, we, we didn't see any evidence uh, that uh, from a behavioral perspective that the rats uh, uh, were, um, were, were troubled by the mm -hmm. therapy any, any more than, than, than the sham group. Um, we also you know, demonstrated that the size of the stomach wasn't, wasn't altered uh, when you compare the sham versus the, the, the gastric mucosal devitalization group. And, and one would expect if we could cause a significant ulcer, there'd be an element of scarring and, and volume mm -hmm. contraction of the stomach, which, which we didn't see uh, in these rats. You know, uh, w whether, again, that's translatable to humans, we, we don't know yet, but, but in these rats, we, we haven't found any strong evidence to suggest that the, that the, uh, that the changes seen were, were as a result of sort of, uh, sort of pain or other injury to, mm -hmm. to the rats. Wow. So what are the next steps? Where are you going from here? You know, I think we, we have uh, we, we had a hypothesis that the gastric mucosa was uh, an important component uh, to sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, we, we're happy that we, uh, that we have some evidence to support that now. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we, we've already gone on to do a, the, the same uh, sort of experiment in, in porcine models. Oh, nice. You know, one of the challenges in pigs is that it's hard to get a, a, a metabolically deranged pig. It's, uh, they're somewhat right. rare and even expensive. Uh, and also to do experiments in, piv, in pigs has a uh, you know, significant cost as, right. as opposed to, to, to rats. So we, uh, we did an experiment whereby we compared a, you know, sham, a sham group of pigs versus a sleeve gastrectomy in pigs. Uh, done with the normal human technique, and we did, you know, for the standard endoscope and, and equipment, uh, gastric mucosal devitalization in pigs as well. And, and actually, our results uh, are very interesting. Uh, and in fact, there is a significant improvement in uh, in visceral adiposity uh, and, and the weight trajectory in pigs in, in the treated group uh, over a sham group. 
so uh, you know, we look forward to, to presenting that data in the very near future. Yeah, I look forward to seeing those results. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today and, and talking to us about your very fascinating study. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Sure.